uh, welcome everyone to today's uh, meeting. Welcome to uh, our fellow humanists and also guests. And uh, my name is Jay Laban. I'm glad to be uh, filling the role of a meeting host today. And uh, today's meeting is uh, gonna have two sections. Some of you have attended maybe the prior meeting, so this shouldn't be really any, any different than uh, what we've done in the past. We're going to have a, uh, a speech, and then we're going to follow up with a, uh, a Q&A Q session. So what I will do is I will actually unmute everyone. So that's what I'm going to do right now. All right, and uh, I will obviously unmute our speaker. Okay. So uh, our feature speaker for today is Randy Block. And um, I'm gonna share with you a bit of information about uh, Randy. Randy has a bachelor degree in journalism and a master's degree in social work, specializing in community organizing. He worked for 30 years as the manager of services for older adults. Since 1978, Randy has been a leader of Gray Panthers of Metro Detroit, an intergenerational social justice organization. He also serves as the chair of the National Council of Gray Panthers networks that take actions on several issues, including women's rights. In 2002, he founded and serves as the director of the Michigan Unitarian Universalist Social Justice Network, NUSGEN. This statewide advocacy organization with around 3,000 members works on an interfaith basis to address issues such as environmental justice, racism, reproductive justice affecting women and LGBTQ people, gun violence prevention and issues impacting immigrants and low income families. Randy has played a leadership role in social justice at Northwest Unitarian Universalist Church in Southfield, which he has attended since 1980. Today, Randy is gonna tell us more about Moosejen. All to you, Randy. Let us, let us welcome, by the way, Randy, I'm gonna do it from my side here using the reaction on the lower grad. There we go. So here you go. All right, Randy, all yours. I, well, I, I feel like I'm in good company here, uh, you know, because uh, I identify as a humanist and a Unitarian. Uh, I, before I say much more, I wanna give out some thank yous to people. I want to thank Jay, uh, and I hope I'm not mangling your name, but uh, Laban, is that how you pronounce it? Yeah, All right. it, it, it's spelled Laban, that's okay. Laban, Laban. okay, Laban. and Larry Friedman, uh, who's uh, also sent information out, so thank you, Larry, for the, the invitation. Uh, I also want to thank the Birmingham uh, Unitarian Church. Uh, your congregation has not only annually shared a plate collection with us, which helped sustain us. But during the first, it was actually with a conversation with a person named George Lentz, who used to be a member of your church, that kind of inspired me to start this organization. George was involved with an interracial justice group with the first U church at that time. And they had somebody come in from the UU service committee to put on an environmental conference and George invited me to go to that. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, so after we had this co conference with UUs all over southeastern Michigan, it made little sense to just uh, not follow up with that, having a degree in community organizing. So I worked with George to develop contacts with people in a, maybe about 10 different UU churches in southeastern Michigan. And as a matter of fact, uh, Birmingham Unitarian Church served as our first fiscal agent before we 
got our nonprofit status. So you go way back, your congregation goes way back with us and, and I owe you all a debt of thanks. I will also say that Mary Jo Ebert and Marty Zilagi uh, are, uh, ser serve on the current board of the Mushin Board of Directors. Um, I know sometimes people like to heal, well, there's Mary Jo. Um, sometimes people like to heal, hear uh, the Unitarian story because I didn't start out being, I wasn't raised as a Unitarian. So I'll give you the sh very short version of it, is that at one point in time, I was gonna be a Baptist minister. Well, you figured there's a, a little change between that and becoming uh, a humanist, uh, but it all started when I took a course in religion at the University of Iowa and found out I no longer believed in God. And so that kind of blew my career path. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, when, I, when I had my faith blown up uh, and I discovered a Unitarian church, I found that I had a new religious home. And even if the people weren't uh, um, always the people I would hang out with, they were people that freed my mind. It opened me up to, to thinking for myself and being uh, a broader person. Uh, so Unitarian Universalism became an alternative way for me to express my spiritual values. And that has certainly made all the difference in my life. Um, also, when I was a young guy, after finishing my my degree in journalism, I faced the draft during the Vietnam War. And so I became the first, I couldn't quite face the idea of killing somebody uh, and that just bothered me a whole lot. And so I became the first conscientious objector in my little rural county. And it wasn't like that, oh, look what I did, but it was like, this was something I kind of had to, I had to do this. You know, it just wasn't right to for me that way. But that that ultimately opened my mind and my heart up to knowing that we all have some responsibility for people outside of our small community, outside of our family. I was concerned about what happens to people who, who I might shoot uh, in, in Vietnam, for example, or we have, and the UU principle says that we uh, have the importance of treating everyone that means Vietnamese, means women, means people of color. Uh, it means uh, people from different cultures. Uh, it means persons from the LGBT community. It means everyone needs to be treated with respect and dignity. And that was, that was an inspiration that I was able to use to create the mission of uh, the Michigan UU Social Justice Network. And it hasn't, I haven't uh, I've opened that up, that idea of a mission to other people who've been on the board and other things, but people seem to have settled that that, that works you know, as a mission, that we can be driven by our desire to work for the, the dignity of other people and as well as ourselves, of course. So um, uh, one of the goals, I, I did do a little homework here of the UU Humanist, Humanist Association is to put our humanist values into action. So social justice is more than just talking about it. It's more, it's more like doing what we can to move just the needle of justice forward. And of course, the famous arc of justice that was a Unitarian uh, concept before Martin Luther King adopted the arc of justice it moves gradually, eventually toward, toward um, the arc of the universe moves toward the toward justice. So, um, of course, there's other principles. I'm giving you all kind of stuff that you already know right now. But why why do we why do we do justice in the first place? There's a whole bunch of people out there that that believe in treating other people well, but they may not be motivated to work for justice. And I can just sort of say. Each, it's probably a little different for each person. Maybe it's the experiences you've had, but I'm, I'm just gonna repeat what you know already, which is some of those UU principles that said, hey, this is justice matters for us. Uh, for example, that we need to, one of the principles was uh, justice, equity, and compassion in human relations. 
the free and responsible search for truth and meaning. I mean, if you don't search for, if you're a humanist, I assume you, you don't have, you're not given the truth. You have to search for it and you have to find it. Uh, the right of conscience, that was kind of spoke to me big time. If I had a conscience that said I'm not supposed to kill and I'm supposed to pe treat people with dignity, that's a unitarian and the democratic process. Uh, so we certainly are, the, what we're facing today is uh, some very undemocratic with a small d uh, principles that are going on in our country. Uh, so there's some things that are not democracy, that people's voices are not being heard. Uh, and then this uh, final goal, the goal of, of uh, world community peace, liberty, justice for all, and respect for the independent web of all existence. So that's, we care about the environment too as a justice issue. So um, I would just, just want to clarify a few things that Mushin is. Uh, we, we have, actually we're working with 26 Unitarian congregations. Uh, whoever introduced me gave me, gave the Unitarians a little more credit than we, we should get here in Michigan, but there's 26 UU churches. Uh, we have a board of directors that comes from all parts of Michigan, so we try to have democracy in the way we set up our bylaws. So we've got two folks from the UP, two from Southwest Michigan, two from Northern Michigan, and on down the line. We have four from the district that uh, Birmingham Unitarian Church is in because we've got a, a lot more people in, in this area. And we have a network of about 2,800 people statewide who receive our action alerts. So we, we know that Unitarians are not the largest denomination on earth. As a matter of fact, we're one of the smaller ones, but we can, we, our voices sometimes carry more weight. Uh, and so there's a lot of groups out there that want to, they know Unitarians are people who care about issues. And so they want to ally with us. Um, we've been had strong relationships with uh, people from United Church of Christ and from the National Council of Jewish Women. Uh, but there are a number of other faiths or uh, religious groups, and I get that word faith sticks on my tongue a little bit, uh, but nevertheless, there's religious groups that share our progressive values. Uh, and so we've aligned with them over the years so we can have more power if there's more people involved. And as I mentioned before, our priority issues are working with women and LGBT rights, racial justice, obviously a little in the news this week, um, immigration reform, environment, water justice, poverty, economic justice, and uh, gun violence prevention. So what have we done? I'd just like to give a, a review and, and part of my presentation is that we're on the cutting edge. And I feel kind of proud that we have done some things that were really um, different and also I think needed. Uh, during this last, during 2019, uh, we were able to get support from a group called the Economic Justice Alliance of Michigan. Uh, they've given us substantial amounts of funding so that we can work for economic justice. So that might mean working for raising the minimum wage. Uh, and there's a, a continuing battle going on about that where the Republican uh, leg controlled lame duck legislature gutted the raise in the minimum wage when we were all collecting signatures to put that on the ballot. There was also the same parallel thing for giving people, uh, families more earned paid sick leave. Of course, we need that right now. If the COVID virus is, is affecting people, particularly people on the front line, we need that. But again, the legislature had reduced the, the benefits of earned paid sick time. So we're working in coalition to try to push, work with the attorney general to try to restore some of those, uh, the, the whole right to democracy is if you can collect signatures, you can get it on the ballot, not that the legislature adopts and then adopts what you do and then amend it. It's just kind of like a way to uh, gut democracy, not just the paid sick leave. So that's one issue uh, we worked for with uh, on LGBT rights with a group, an interfaith group called Inclusive Justice. Uh, the 
they're going to be on Monday uh, announcing that they'll be calling on pastors, ministers all over the state to sign on to a declaration that calls for their endorsement of LGBTQ plus rights. Uh, so we'll be uh, encouraging, I've just got a letter I'll be sending out to clergy throughout the state here this weekend that will be allowing clergy to put their values in writing. Uh, and we certainly know that when we were trying to get the Elliot Larson Civil Rights Act amended through a petition that we've been promoting, uh, that the, the court has sided with this campaign. It is not ended yet because they've taken it to court that during the COVID vi virus time, they ought to be able to get more time and have not have to collect quite so many signatures to make the Civil Rights Act include folks from the LGBT community. Uh, we had developed and maintained a, a, a um, Women's and LGBT Rights Coalition. Uh, it's called an Interfaith Reproductive Justice Coalition where we give, matter of fact, I got a meeting on Tuesday where we're trying to give state-of-the-art information about what's going on so that different groups can then learn and work with us on, on different issues. So if you're interested in some of these things, make a mental note of that. And I want you to be able to email me and say, I'd like to get on your list if you're not on our list already. Uh, we did urge Governor Whitmer uh, last year to veto a bill that would limit abortions by telemedicine. I just had my first telemedicine doctor's appointment yesterday and it's kind of like it's now not become a nice thing but it become a very practical thing that we can that doctors can communicate with us by telemedicine and the previous legislature had wanted to outlaw telemedicine uh, for, they had a ban on telemedicine for people who need to get medicine abortions. So fortunately we had, we were able to push uh, the previous governor to not renew that ban. And then we were able to uh, get Governor Whitmer to veto a bill that would set that kind of limit on telemedicine. Uh, we have been working hard and I know that some of you are, who are involved with environmental justice know that people in the city of Detroit, there may be around 10,500 people that didn't have their, had their water shut off and they couldn't afford to pay their water bills is a big part of the problem. And that is certainly disproportionately affecting people of color. And, and the mayor is making, the mayor Duggan is doing all kinds of things to make it look like he's doing a great job, you know, with the coronavirus, but he's been dragging his feet and I've been working, we've been working with a group called the People's Water Board and there are other groups that are concerned. We'll be meeting with uh, staff from Eagle, uh, Environmental Great Lakes Authority on Monday to give for, uh, have a further demonstration. They don't know it yet, that there'll be signs, they'll be letting them know that don't abandon uh, people who don't have their water shut off during the COVID crisis. So we're part of that effort. Uh, we um, <laughs> are launching into, and I must say that Birmingham Unitarian Church is a, a kind of an inspirational church to us. Uh, in terms of get out the vote. We know that everyone has a huge stake in whether they vote or not. And Mary Jo and other people from your congregation have been on the front lines of trying to get, educate people beyond just voting to know what are the issues. So we appreciate that very much. We're on the verge of launching a statewide campaign for get out the vote. Uh, that we'll be having some training coming up on Know Your Rights. Uh, we'll be having training on how to, we have people from 17 new congregations that have said yes to being part of our Get Out the Vote campaign. So that's something this year. I can just mention, here are a few things that we've done since March of this year uh, that have reported to our board. Uh, we have as part of our Reproductive Justice Coalition. And this is all, this is like a COVID report kind of thing. All of these things we had to do 
just like you, uh, we were, had to learn how to use Zoom and we're make, trying to make it work. And I, again, thank Mary Jo for giving me some lessons and helping me with that. Um, but we did have people on our Interfaith Reproductive Justice Coalition, a 92 year old woman who's been fighting for the Equal Rights Amendment since she was in her 40s or 30s. And then we had a young woman on that call who was in her teen, as a teenager, and they've started a generation ratify group in Michigan to try to promote, uh, push, There's they've gotten enough states now to get the Equal Rights Amendment passed. They just need to get Congress to allow, allow that that Equal Rights Amendment to be ratified. So we've highlighted that. Uh, we're also, um, we did have been, we send out action alerts almost every week. So in the last three months, I've sent out 13, 11 action alerts that covered a broad range of things. They always have talking points. They will tell, we always try to provide information. We don't assume that people, just because you're a Unitarian or just because you're a nice person, that you, you know what you're talking about. I try to really gather the facts and to present them to people and then give them some who, what to do, uh, some talking points if they choose to use those. So we had one talking point, for example, on uh, the, um, one, of, one, of, one of the big COVID bills they called the CARES Act. And that's where we each got $1,200, uh, you know, as an individual st economic stimulus. But this was also something where people who were on SSI, supplemental security income, very low income people, or people who are on veterans benefits, were going to have to, who might not normally even file their taxes, were going to have to go through the process of filing taxes to get their $1,200. So we advocated for uh, having direct deposit for people on SSI and for the veterans, dis dis disabled veterans. And we weren't the only ones doing it. So I won't say that we were the, the, the end all be all, but we did feel like we, they, they changed their mind. And now veteran, the people on SSI and, and SSD and veterans benefits had their checks sent to them direct deposit. Um, we uh, coordinated with, um, we've been coordinating with You, You, The Vote. Uh, we got a, a $10,000 grant from the Michigan Economic Justice Action Fund, which is a group, just put that in the bank the other day and just hired someone to, we got two people hired to work on Get Out The Vote activities. Uh, we got a grant last fall from the UUA to Here's, here's another area where BUC, it's kind of like a, we, we can hold you up as a, an example of what to do right. Uh, but we have a, a, the UUA has something called renewing, uh, renewing your, um, oh, how my brain is working here for me. Uh, Randy, I think you mean welcoming congregations? Yeah, renewing your welcoming, it's called. And so we've made a commitment to work to get five churches in Michigan, and we, and BUC has now gotten its renewing, its welcoming congregation. And so we've got a staff who's making calls to other churches to let them know. And again, what you all are doing gives, uh, gives other people encouragement that maybe they can do it too. Um, and I've been serving on a one fair wage steering committee and also a committee having to do with um, the earned paid sick time. Uh, and we've been advocating for um, storing those benefits at both the federal and the state level. So at this point, I've given you quite a few things that we've done. And I would just say, though, the, the, very, the very most recent things are this, this week uh, with the um, attacks, uh, a killing of a, um, a black man in Minneapolis. Uh, we'll be sending out an alert here tomorrow on that. Uh, but there will be, uh, there's a person from our new church in Flint named Jerry Kerr. And they'll be having a vigil 
uh, for um, the uh, here we go. We'll be having the vigil tonight at seven o'clock at the church. Uh, no, not at the church, but uh, at, on face. It's a Facebook live event with UU Church of Flint. Uh, I can give you Jerry's phone number or I can give you the Facebook URL if you want to join in on that. Uh, but uh, that's for, um, uh, if you want it, it's uh, facebook.com UU Congregation of Flint. Is That's our Facebook page. So I think I'm going to uh, stop there and see. Oh, yeah, if you uh, do not yet receive our action alerts, there's no charge to receive our action alerts. Uh, if you would go to our website and sign up for them, it's uh, www.uujustice.org, www.uujustice.org. And so you can get with, but you also, we also invite you to become a member or support us so that we can help sustain what we're doing. So um, with that, I'm going to stop and ask if you have any questions. All right, thank you very much, uh, Randy, for all the information that you shared with us today. So at this time, we're gonna switch to the Q&A session. And I see we have about uh, 20 people in the meeting today. So if you have a question, I will ask you to raise your electronic hand. So the electronic hand, the way you raise it is uh, through, the, uh, through the Zoom feature, you go to participants, you click on that button, and then you go to the bottom right hand of your screen, and then uh, you click on the raise hand button, and that will actually show up on my side as you have raised your hand. Uh, I'm going to do the best that I can to facilitate this section of the meeting. Not sure how that's going to work with the people who are uh, just uh, using the phone, but we'll figure it out. So what I'm going to do next is I'm going to mute uh, everyone. And it's, it seems like Larry Friedman has a question. And it's a good feature to know that it looks like both on my screen, it shows next to your name that you have a hand. And also I see that next to your picture, there's also a hand. So I believe I have unmuted everyone, but I still, go ahead, Larry, let's see if we can hear you. I just had to unmute myself, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Go ahead, sir. Um, by the way, they should know to raise your hand, you have to click, click on your own name first on that list of participants and then click on raise hand. Anyway, uh, my question to Randy is uh, uh, because of the uh, current economic situation and uh, the COVID, there's a lot of talk about contributions and activities of nonprofit organizations are, are in dire states and uh, I'm just wondering if this is affected what you're doing and uh, if you feel that's going to, if the economy does recover, uh, are things are going to improve. And I just wonder yeah. how the economic situation currently is affecting social justice. Well, it's kind of two, two I have two responses, Larry, to that question. Number one, the, the COVID crisis is almost opening up the wounds of our society. So for example, if you were uh, the example of water, if there were people that didn't have water for years, and, but nevertheless, when people couldn't wash their hands, then suddenly it took on a whole, whole new urgency to address that issue. Or the issues of racism, uh, which has been around for decades and, and centuries, actually, uh, when you see that there's disproportionate number of people of color that are dying from COVID virus, that opens a new urgency for, 
for justice or if you had discrimination against people who had disabilities and a, a Unitarian named Dessa Cosma who started her yeah. own uh, Detroit Disability uh, Network uh, has appealed to the state and they were part of a coalition to make sure that people with disabilities do not get discriminated against during the COVID crisis. So there's been, a, there's been it's opened up opportunities for us to deal with things that might not otherwise get taken seriously. On the other hand, what, you, what you're asking about is money, and there are definitely more, there's higher unemployment than there was almost percentage-wise in the Great Depression. So if you're not employed and you're, although unemployment, we have fortunately with the, the CARES Act, we're able to get uh, some extension of unemployment benefits and we need another one called the HEROES Act that we're pushing for that would extend more unemployment benefits. So there's some serious problems, economic problems. Funny enough, there are some people that like myself pay perhaps that are on a, on a re, uh, retire, uh, on our social security where uh, our, we're not affected by the cuts in, in, in employment. So, but we may have received that $1,200 from this and we may get even another one. So there's some people uh, who are like myself are more fortunate than others that we have, we've got actually as much or more money as what we did before. So churches are having to adapt to that. And uh, my church, for example, at Northwest, we, we always had the opportunity for people to donate online, but now that becomes a prominent feature. So, um, it's it's going to be a, a big squeeze on all kinds of nonprofit organizations that are counting on individual donations. We're fortunate to have some, um, some major grants that have helped us sustain this. So we're not we're not worried about going down, but we do have to know that some people just can't afford to to become members of our group like they were before. So I have to turn to do more grant writing and things like that. Does that give you a... Yeah, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. So Larry Friedman, I see that you still have your hand, uh, ha hand up. No, I, my, well, I, I don't know how to un unhand okay. me, but go ahead with something I can, else. <laughs> I can lower it from my side, that's okay. It should be in the yeah. same area. Yeah, yeah, I'll raise my hand. <laughs> it, looks like, it looks like Larry Larson has a question, right Larry? Go ahead. Yeah, yeah, it's a similar question. Uh, if we, if you don't mind me calling you Randy, uh, yeah, that's, that's we. Um, I was wondering how usually how important it is for uh, donations to receive donations because um, I'm sure grants kind of run out eventually, and how important are, are individual donations as well as. Uh, Church donations. Uh, our church usually, in the last few years, has donated uh, maybe seven hundred to a thousand dollars at a time. Or we take twenty-five percent of our plate collections and donate it for the whole month to Mission. Mission. And I wonder if, out of the twenty-six uh, churches that you collaborate with. Uh, do very many of them contribute as a church? Well, we've got, and thank you for that question, because it's it's all always gets down to the, how do how do we sustain ourselves? We're doing good work, but we have to s keep it going. And so, individual memberships, as well as as contributions or shared plate donations and memberships from from UU congregations, are really an important part of our project. Uh, there, that's money that will allow us to do things that we couldn't otherwise do when we're limited by grants. So we will count on maybe $10,000 worth of money coming in from memberships. And so we have to, in, from my standpoint, uh, we have to earn it. People don't give money just because they like the looks of your face. And in that case, I might be in big trouble. But in, in either case, <laughs> In either case, uh, we have to we have to earn the respect 
uh, enough that people will say, here's something that I want to contribute to that will make, try to make a difference. So yes, those, that really makes a difference for us in terms of our keeping our thing going along, especially with the congregational donations. We may have about, so far we have around eight congregations who've shared a plate. Uh, my goal is to, to at least double that here this year. And so sometimes congregations sort of spread it out over different times of year instead of having it coming in and out again. So does that, that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Yeah, Jay, is it okay if I add a comment there? Yeah, go ahead. Um, so just adding kind of a local flair to that. Uh, some of you who are part of this call today, but not all of you know that, know me and know that some of you don't know that I'm a member of Birmingham Unitarian Church and I led the social and environmental justice program for about seven years and have continued to be involved when I first started learning about what Moose Gen is, um, I was really glad to hear what it was all about because one of the things that is really hard to do as a congregational social justice program is to keep up with um, the legislative work that is going on um, or that needs to go on. And one of the core services that Moose Gen provides is that research, doing that research and packaging for us what we can do. So we'll get an alert that says, here's the issue, here's who you call, or this is what you do, Tell, just tells you exactly what to do. It is really difficult if every congregation in our region or across the state had to try to do all of that research on their own. So it's a really nice complimentary service to the more hands-on work that we organize for our congregations to do. So, uh, you know, if you're if you're looking for organizations that you might want to consider supporting, a Moose membership. I should know this, but Randy, I think for an individual, it's like twenty or twenty-five dollars. Twenty-five dollars, and then there we give people different ranges: twenty-five uh, individual, forty for a family, fifty if they want to uh, become a silver member. $100 is a gold member, and we even have a category of people to give more $200 or more as part of their membership. So it's, some people feel more comfortable giving, and then we have this rule that if you can't afford the $25, we will not deny you membership. So we try to keep it, keep it affordable for people. Yeah, so I think of it as something where you might donate a small amount of money that gets pooled with others and really gets widely leveraged in this work that we're doing across the state. And then the other option is, as Randy mentioned earlier, whether you're a paying member or not, doesn't matter. You can sign up to be on the Moose Gen alert list so that you get those alerts that I described a couple minutes ago. All right, thank you, thank you Mary Jo. A couple of things from my side. Uh, many of you know that I'm an engineer, so I'm always looking for uh, better better way to, to run this meeting. God, I just realized that I failed to share with you that this meeting is being recorded. This is the way we've been running all our uh, meetings. Just want to make sure that everybody is aware of that. Uh, and this gives the, this gives the uh, opportunity for uh, the rest of the team members who could not make today's meeting uh, to actually watch it. Uh, after this meeting has concluded. So I just failed to mention that to you in the beginning of the meeting. I just want to be sure that everybody is comfortable with that. If you're not, please, please let us know. The other thing for the folks that are on the phone, I know you, you, some of you cannot see what's going on on the screen, but there was some static going on at one time and we can see actually the speaking role going back and forth between uh, the folks uh, that are shown on the screen and the folks that are actually uh, using their um, their phones. So please make sure when you're not uh, preparing for a question to mute, to mute your phone on your side to help make sure that um, we um, keep this uh, meeting running. All right, are there any other questions? Any other questions for Randy? Anybody who wants to raise his hand <laughs> or just 
Okay, it looks like Larry Larson has another question. Go ahead, Larry. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah uh, I, I know a minister that <clears throat> thinks that uh, the church's primary duty is, or purpose is to promote uh, virtues and principles and that social reform is uh, much lower on the totem pole of, of purposes. And I, I know that, uh, Randy, you've expressed your promotion of, or your uh, feelings about principles, and they're important to you. But what do you what do you think about a church that just doesn't uh, get too excited about social reform or social action, political action? They're, they're concerned about celebrating uh, values and virtues, primarily. Well, I think ministers, like people in general, come in all kinds of shapes and sizes, as well as values about what they have towards social activism. So I guess people sometimes go to churches, maybe where the minister or the clergy person sort of matches up, sometimes it will match up with what they believe or is right or wrong. Uh, I would just say that if you believed in love, if you believe in respecting other people, then you have to do something with that belief or you're just giving, you know, philosophy. And armchair philosophy doesn't cut it as far as I'm concerned. You have to be willing to uh, be a little more bold than just saying, I love you. And, and But if you're in, you fell in a ditch, well, that's your problem, you know. And, and so that's how how we we have to live our our values not just love our values and you know people go to where they want it where they want to get what they want to get and i don't i'm not talking about how about being political i'm talking about being an activist so i can be a 501c3 uh, meaning we don't work for or against candidates that I understand faith groups who are nonprofits can't, are not supposed to be, unless maybe they're Catholic. Uh, and that was a snarky comment there. But they would, they might, they're not supposed to be supporting or opposing candidates just because of that tax status. But there's a whole range of advocacy that faith groups, congregations can do that's, that doesn't jeopardize your, your nonprofit status. So. You can you can advocate for doing the right thing, even even if it's a bill in the legislature, and that doesn't get you in any trouble, uh, unless you start saying I support X Y Z candidate or, so, I'm, that's my comment. I I guess. You know. All right. Thank you, Larry. I believe Anne has a question. Yes, um, Randy. Do you have paid staff, and um, how do they function? you well actually i've had more paid staff than i've ever had before uh, because i'm getting more grants than ever before but i have a but we're all part-time so it's not like we've this big bureaucracy but i have a staff person named jennifer teed who um, specializes in racism and, and environmental justice i've got a person uh, named um, D Church just hired D a month ago to work on LGBT rights organize. She's an LG They are an LGBT rights organizer. Uh, I've got a new person uh, that uh, well, a, a person from a year ago that works as our uh, website and social media organizer. Uh, a person named Kathleen Cook, who's a member of the UU Church in Farmington. And she's a bisexual person who's in her 30s and got three little girls. So she keeps busy, but she's also helps us with our website and social media. And then I've got a person that works um, uh, named Sharon Peterson. And she's a woman from, goes to the U Church in Jackson. And she's now our uh, get out the vote uh, campaign manager. 
So she just started this last week, and she, well, a week ago. So all of a sudden, I've got all kinds of people that are doing things, and my job is to make sure that they get support for doing the right thing. All right, it looks like Terry has a question. Go ahead, Terry. Yes, thank you. I, I appreciate your presentation. Um, I am curious, you mentioned the 501c3. Is that your status and what part are you able to use of your funds for political lobbying? Uh, we, are, we have been a 501c3 and we still are. Uh, we do not, and, and because of that, we do not support or oppose candidates, even though I might have my personal opinions about number 45. Uh, Lutgen, uh is, is not an extension of my support or opposition for candidates. We can, a 501c3 like Birmingham Unitarian Church and like Muthchen can always stand up for issues and not be in violation of our, our tax status. Mm -hmm. okay. I have a follow-up question too for our moderator. Uh, you indicate Birmingham Unitarian Church. This is the first time I've been part of this forum. I'm just wondering uh, who you are, and maybe if you could identify yourself a little bit, so I'm familiar with, with who you as moderator are and how you relate to this group. Well, I am a, uh, a member of Birmingham Unitarian Church, and I've been a, uh, a member of the church since 2005. Mm -hmm. I'm also currently serving on the board of trustees for the church. Um, you can find out more about our uh, church by visiting our website. Um, look us up on the internet, Birmingham Unitarian Church. Yeah, I are... was a member a number of years ago, uh, quite a while ago, actually. Um, and I, I have not been affiliated that recently. Uh, what is your name? I, I'm not sure. I, your name is not present there. Oh, I see. I see. So my name is Jay Laban, and the reason why you do not see my name is because I'm using the church account. Right, yeah, I, I just changed my name. I think you can do that, but I appreciate uh, knowing that as well, thank you. And, and appreciate you putting this together. Sure, let me actually put it in my, I'll put it in the, the chat, by the way. Can I also mention for the group here that Moosjin is one of, of, of over 22 statewide networks so we got our start with funding from the UU Service Committee, uh, but and so we were like the second or the third statewide network in the country after the California Legislative Ministry. But there's this, there, there are Unitarians that are organizing statewide on these issues all over the country. So we, you know, we're, we're not the only one out there is what I'm saying. Okay, and just to follow up to Terry's uh, request, I did include my contact information in the chat window. Would also recommend that Larry uh, Larson and Larry Friedman do the same. So uh, it's currently 1.48. Uh, maybe we should start to try to wrap up this meeting. Are there any other questions? It looks like Larry has a question. Go ahead, Larry. Yeah, Randy, I wondered if uh, you have speakers available for all 26 uh, UU community organizations, uh, or, the, or is this something unusual for for Muschen to to talk to groups like this, I, or to you know, or visit churches and, and provide talks about Muschen? Uh, I haven't been doing a lot of it lately, but over the years, I have given presentations at maybe a dozen different congregations, and it's kind. Of, I look at it as my way to get acquainted on a face-to-face -face level or at a per more personal level with people in congregations. So it's an. I look at it as an opportunity for the congregation to learn what we're doing, and for us to get acquainted with them because we see ourselves as a a resource for congregations and we want them to know that we're out there for one thing and we we want to be able to be partners with with congregations but are you able to visit all 26 you uh, use and are you the only speaker well 
Jennifer Teed has done like has done speaking at different churches, and so but I've got these new staff, two new staff that may very well be called into service. I just haven't asked them yet. I'll put it that way. They're less than a month old with the organization. But if you know, if you're thinking of a certain place where you want a speaker, just let me know. Okay. Well, you, you gave a, a great talk and I appreciate it very much. All right, thank you so much, Randy. Appreciate you coming in and speaking at uh, our meeting today. I have enjoyed your speech tremendously. Uh, just a heads up for the uh, next meeting. Our next meeting is going to be held uh, two weeks from now, uh, uh, June the 13th at 1 o'clock. And our speak uh, speaker is going to be Professor uh, Mike uh, Witte. Uh, he's going to be speaking to us about humanistic uh, psychology. Uh, Larry Larson and Larry Friedman, anything you want to add more to uh, to what I just said regarding the upcoming upcoming? Yeah, meeting? it's it's uh, June thirteenth, uh, two weeks from today at one o'clock. And Professor uh, Witte is uh, from the University of Michigan Dearborn. He's a member of the Birmingham Temple, and he's spoken to uh, many of the UU churches, especially the first church of Detroit, UU church. And, I, and he even said he spoke at BUC at one time. He's spoken at the Northwest uh, UU church. And he founded the Citizens for Tolerance and Decency. And it's an organization to restore civility to public life and politics. He's a member of the ACLU and the Birmingham Bloomfield Democratic Club. And the title of his talk is Embracing Humanistic Psychology to Calm Fears Concerning Health and Safety in This Moment of Anxiety. All right, thank you, Larry. Is there any other comments uh, from the humanists at BUC? Planning Committee. Anything else that we want to share at this time? Okay. Are there any other comments from anyone? Our guests? I see a lot of new faces. Yeah, go ahead, Janine, please. Um, just to throw out there for everyone to make sure that um, when you get your absentee um, application, to check off to be put on your permanent absent voter list, if that's an option. And just to know that being called a permanent absentee never means that you actually have to vote absentee. Um, it should be known that you can carry your mailed ballot. You could even be receive the ballot and even carry it back to your voting place if you're really bent on um, voting in person. So you always have the option to vote in person. But of course, it's a really good idea now to exercise your right to vote by mail. So please spread that word to everybody. Um, really get on. And also it helps to get put on the absent, permanent absent voter list, even though you heard that it's coming from the state. Um, it saves them money. It comes more directly from your local um, city clerk if you get put on the permanent absent voter list. So um, please spread the word about that. I will definitely recommend that. I've tried it recently. Thank you, Janine, for the reminder. Yeah. Still trying to convince my, my wife and my two daughters to do the same. But it's a great thing to have that envelope show up at your house. And just like Janine said, you always have the choice if you want to still go vote in person. If you want to yep. still wait in line, you can still do that. Right. So it's, not, it's just giving you more options. Yep. Thank you yeah, so most, much. Most places have depository slots as well. You don't have to mail it so you can wait a day or two before the election in case you might want to change your mind on anything or have more information about various issues. It's a good thing to do. 
Anything else we want to share? It looks like Mary Jo has another question or comment. Go ahead, Mary. Yeah, uh, one quick thing. If you have not yet completed the census, right. please do that. It is the basis for redistricting. It will determine how many seats Michigan will have in the U.S. House of Representatives. It is a big driver for a portion of the money that we pay in federal taxes to come back to the state of Michigan for education, infrastructure, hospitals, and so on. Um, if you have any questions at all about that, if you got stuck somewhere, haven't done it, feel free to reach out to me and I'm happy to help. And please do pass the word to your families. Michigan right now ranks fourth in the country in our response rate, but we have almost 3 million people that we still need to get uh, recorded for the census. Thank you, Mary Jo. Any comments regarding the meeting? We tried to obviously strike the right balance here with regarding to muting and unmuting everyone. Uh, our Q&A session was obviously moderated to a certain degree and obviously everybody was unmuted. It's just kind of the format that everybody is comfortable in using for the next meeting. Or are there any, any suggestions to change the meeting? Seems like Stu is happy with the way we did it. Thumbs up. All right. Appreciate it. We're good. Okay, anything else? Any final comments before we close this one? This is one more, this is like an announcement. So I, I apologize yes, if I'm over speaking to a group, but with my other organization, the Gray Panthers of Metro Detroit, we'll be having a speaker from on the 20th of June from the ACLU, and it'll be talking about the impact of the COVID virus on people in prisons. And it's pretty outrageous. Uh, I've been advocating for a prisoner who's uh, been unjustly put in prison for over 30 years, and he's now has the COVID virus. But there's a whole bunch of folks in prisons that are coming down with the virus, and it's it's something where we need to respond to that. So they'll be on the 20th at 10 a.m. And I, if you want information, go to the Gray Panthers of Metro Detroit.org, and you can. We have an events calendar that's also posted on the Moosejin website, so you can see what's going on in the Metro Detroit area, and you have the the links to the the Zoom meetings that folks are doing now. Thanks. All right. Thank you, Randy.